Well, it's time to get started. This is uh, the traditional church service meeting of Spirit and Truth Fellowship in Knoxville. It's Sunday, September 11th of 2011. And of course, this is a very um, day that we uh, remember because of the tragedy that happened uh, 10 years ago today. Uh, but we're here to bless the name of the Lord and to thank Him for the blessings that He has given to us. And, and really, if we think back on that day, we can really think of blessings that God was watching over on that day as well. Uh, despite the tragedy, there were many more lives that could have been lost. And so we thank God for that. Uh, let's open with prayer, and then we have a lesson um, on Moses. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you right now. We are truly grateful to be here today. We thank you for the blessings you've given to us. We thank you for, um, Lord, the, the treasured memories that we have of uh, those who uh, survived September 11th of 2001. Father, it's uh, terrible what happened, but Lord, we know that your hand was on our country and the people of New York City, even on that very day, and in Washington, D.C. as well. Lord, Father, we know that tragedy could have been much greater, uh, but Father, you... Um, Father, your hand was on the entire situation, helping uh, to rescue some that were rescued, Father, and uh, Father, to prevent people from going who would have otherwise gone and, and been part of the, of the loss of human life. But Father, Lord, we know that, Lord, you have given promises to every human being, Father, dear Lord. Whether we uh, live or whether we die, Father, we can be partakers in those promises. Father, and above all, Lord, promised that you would not leave us in the grave. And Father, we believe your promises. We believe what you have done to redeem us from the curse of the grave. Father, we thank you and uh, we just praise you for the works that you have done. Uh, Father, we ask these words in Jesus' name. We pray that you're going to be upon the service. We give us time to you. Jesus. Okay. Well, uh, we're continuing a sermon series on the power of promise. And I'm not going to go through the list of all the uh, sermons that we've done, uh, but we're on number eight. And today we're going to be talking about God's unstoppable promises. And the lesson today is on Moses. And here's a picture that uh, I found that I uh, really enjoy. This uh, um, basically is showing Moses standing in front of the Red Sea, and it's depicting a miracle described in the Bible of the parting of the Red Sea. Our lesson today is on Moses and the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt. And as we look at Moses, we're going to be looking at who he was, but we're only going to get a very short glimpse of, of really the, the whole story of Moses. Uh, we're going to be basically touching on the part of the fact that he was a prince of Egypt and that he was a deliverer of the people, of the, of the Hebrew people, of uh, the children of Israel who were in Egypt. The story of Moses is very extensive. If we were to cover it all, we would uh, be covering four books of the Old Testament, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and very many chapters from the Bible. It's far too much information to, to talk about, certainly in our setting. So we're just going to kind of survey that information. And today's lesson is going to cover really the sections uh, described in chapters 1 through 14 of Exodus. And our focus today is we're going to uh, be placing the story of Moses and the Exodus in the context of Egyptian history, and we want to understand God's promise and how he fulfilled it. So our previous lessons leading up to this were on Abraham and last Time we met. Uh, the lesson was that the promises carry forward, and we talked about Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So, this is the story that's leading up to the time of Moses. Now, I'm going to read now from the uh, book of Acts, chapter 7, starting with verse 2, and a few selected verses here. Verse 2, 4 through 6. The God of glory appeared to our ancestor Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. God had him move there from there to Canaan 
And he did not give him any of it as a heritage, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as his possession and his descendants after him, even though he had no child. And God spoke in these terms, that his descendants would be resident aliens in a country belonging to others who would enslave them and mistreat them during 400 years. This is in the book of Acts chapter 7. Now, of course, in our previous lessons, we talked about Abraham, and, and the diagram you can see here on the screen, uh, this map shows the path that Abraham took from his native Mesopotamia, uh, basically through Canaan to Egypt and then back to Canaan. And while he was in Canaan, he began to have children, and this was also fulfillment of God's promise. Abraham and Sarah had a son, Isaac, and Isaac had a son, Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, and these are the people that we call the children of Israel. And our previous, um, our previous uh, lesson was, again, on Isaac, Jacob, and down to Joseph. Let's continue reading in Acts. Acts chapter 7, picking up with verse 9. The patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into slavery. But God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and enabled him to win favor and to show wisdom when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who appointed him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Then Joseph sent and invited his father Jacob and all his relatives to come to him, 75 in all. So Jacob went down to Egypt. And the next slide shows an artist's conception of, of ancient people standing in front of the pyramids of Egypt. Continuing in Acts chapter 7, verse 17. But as the time drew near for the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to Abraham, our people in Egypt increased and multiplied until another king who had not known Joseph ruled over Egypt. He dealt craftily with our race and forced our ancestors to abandon their infants so that they would die. At this time, Moses was born. So, this is kind of the story leading up to where we are today. We talked about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And this summary in Acts basically talks about what happened when, when how Joseph came to Egypt as a slave, but then God raised him up when Pharaoh saw his wisdom and elevated him to a position of ruling over Egypt. He was second, essentially the second in command right under Pharaoh. And then Joseph brought the rest of his family to Egypt. So the children of Israel was his brothers, and all of them are listed here. Again, the sons of Jacob. And last time we looked at Joseph in particular, but this time we're going to be looking at Le Levi, or Levi, if I might pronounce it. He was one of the other sons. If you look at the diagram, he's one of the, the small uh, uh, icons of people there. So Levi was Joseph's brother. Joseph was elevated to be king under, or, or as a ruler underneath the Pharaoh. But Levi, his brother, is, is where we're going to follow next. Levi had a son, and it's kind of hard to read there, it's Kohath, and Kohath had a son whose name was Amram, and Amram had three children who are important for the story of Moses, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. Now our attention is actually going to shift today, of course, to Levi's descendant, which is Moses. Okay, let's pick up in Acts chapter 7. For three months he was brought up in his father's house. We'll talk about Moses here. For three months he was brought up in his father's house, and when he was abandoned, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. So Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in his words and deeds. So let me summarize real quick. The Egyptians were dealing craftily with the Hebrews who lived among them. The 
very numerous, and so they tried to basically force them to abandon their children because they, they, didn't, they wanted to control the size of the population of these Hebrews. And if they didn't comply with that, they, they, they would have, you know, the soldiers of Egypt would come and, and force their hand. But basically Moses was hidden, and his, his mother hid him for three months, and when she couldn't hide it any, anymore, she crafted a basket, weaved it, and set him adrift in the Nile River. And then it was Pharaoh's daughter, who was near the edge of the water, saw the basket, retrieved it. So when she opened the basket, she realized that this was one of the condemned Hebrew children. She had compassion on him and decided that she wanted to raise him as her own son. And this is how Moses came to be in the court of Pharaoh. He was a Hebrew born uh, to the tribe of Levi, but he was brought into Pharaoh's house by Pharaoh's daughter. So Moses being instructed in all the ways of Egypt and being the adopted son of the daughter of Pharaoh, essentially he was the grandson of the Pharaoh. That's why he was a prince of Egypt. And he lived as a prince of Egypt for the first 40 years of his life. Continuing with Acts chapter 7. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his relatives, the Israelites. When he saw one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. Moses fled and became a resident alien in the land of Midian. So a quick timeline of Moses. If we were to summarize his life, here's what we'd say. At age three months, Moses is set adrift on the Nile River in the basket. Pharaoh's daughter finds him and adopts him. That's Exodus chapter 2. And at age 40, being a prince of Egypt for 40 years, he finally reaches out to his own people, to the Hebrews, to the children of Israel. And he decides to basically leave his position because he had compassion and he felt a connection with his own people who were enslaved. But because he killed an Egyptian, he flees Egypt. That's at age 40. Forty years in the wilderness, he married, he had his own sons. At age 80, Moses has an encounter with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We won't go into the details, but it's the burning bush when God appeared to him through an angel in the fire. And he gave him commands. And he told him he wanted to go back to Egypt. He wanted him to go back and free the slaves who were in Egypt because God had heard their cries. So at age 80, he goes back to Egypt. That's Exodus chapter 7. And much later on, after the Exodus, just to complete the timeline, um, at age 120, Moses dies after leading the people and they're in the desert for a 40-year journey. It's the timeline of Moses. So we want today to connect the story of how Moses came to be, of, of stories that are in the Bible here that we've talked about, and connect them to Egypt's history. How do these two fit together? This is a real story, there should be some connections. And in particular, the things that at least was interesting to me in that is if you have uh, the Pharaoh appointing Joseph to be a ruler essentially a, a king under him ruling over Egypt, that, that seems like it would be a fantastic fairy tale. That, you know, it would be like you know, me walking into the White House and they make it be the vice president for some reason. I mean, just, it's very unlikely to think, and you think, oh, that's, that can't be true. Um, and then another thing that I thought was of particular interest was the part where it talked about another king came up who didn't know who Joseph was. So let's look at this a little bit more. We're going to dive into some Egyptian history here. Now, I'm not an expert on Egyptian history, I'm, but I, I surveyed that and have, have looked through this um, so that we can uh, go into this uh, a little bit. Basically, from my study, there are uh, essentially 14 periods of history of Egypt that basically are, are recorded up through uh, some years into the, in the Roman era. But uh, the history of Egypt actually begins t really 12,000 years ago um, where they basically have um, 
basically excavated some sites that are in Egypt. Uh, above the Nile, there's some terraces in the rock, and they found uh, artifacts like arrowheads and things in pottery and things like that they found. And, and they dated these to about 12,000 years ago. But then it's interesting because there's a, there's a gap of about 3,000 years where there's no artifacts at all. They can't find any evidence that there was any humans there uh, from the resources that I read. So we had our lesson, uh, uh, well, several lessons ago, we talked about Noah and the flood. And I think it's kind of interesting, if you take that story literally, that there was a literal flood on the earth. It makes sense that that would have been right about the time we would have expected it to be. So in Egyptian history, you had evidence of people in this place a long time ago, and then a great gap. But then, uh, starting about 3,500 years BC, they started to see settlements kind of move in and start to people start to resettle this area. So, in the very, very earliest of of Egyptian history, if you don't count those, you know, earliest artifacts that are really deep down the soil, you might. This is actually where I can see the, the, the modern Egyptian race begin to settle in here uh, between 5,500 and 3,100 years ago, uh, or years BC. Basically, during this period, there, there really aren't any records um, that have a few names of who some of the rulers were. There's one uh, that's called the Scorpion, was the name of the king at that time, and, and they've made a, a movie about that if you're a, an action movie buff. I kind of watched some of these movies. Uh, you may remember The Rock played the Scorpion King. Well, Scorpion was the name of the earliest king, I think. It's kind of part historical and part mythical. So anyways, I just thought I'd throw that in. If you, if you want to get a, maybe some sense of, uh, of what people kind of think of that area, or, or at least some of, the, uh, uh, some of the fiction they write about that area, uh, in the Scorpion King, but that's talking about ancient Egyptian history, and they call that time period when there really is no records of that time. They call that Dynasty Zero. So think about ancient peoples and, and family lines of rulers. These are dynasties, uh, is the proper word. Uh, but when we get into really where there's some records of Egyptian history, we're talking about. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, that time period, when you get into uh, other periods, there's the pre-dynastic, proto-dynastic, early dynastic. Uh, and then finally we get up to this period called the Old Kingdom, which is about 26, 2700 years BC. And it goes up to uh, an era called the Middle Kingdom. The pyramids, this is when the pyramids were built. The age of the pyramids, there are about 138 pyramids that have been discovered so far in Egypt, at least up until 2008. Most of them were built between 2630 and 1813 BC, and that's from the 3rd to the 12th dynasties. Um, I found a quote in one of the secular resources that basically said, long before you know Abraham, long before those stories, you know, Egypt had a thousand years of history before that. And, and, and I, I don't dispute that. That's uh, you know, when Abraham came down to Egypt, and we know this journey took him from Mesopotamia through Canaan to Egypt. You know, there was already pharaohs who were running the place then. I mean, there was there was government. The Egyptian nation had already been there for a very long time. So as we continue on, though, beyond that, we get into this period called the Second Intermediate Period, which is 1700 BC. And basically, it's called the intermediate period because there's kind of an interruption in the system of government that was in place in Egypt. There was a time where there were foreign leaders that ran the country, and this is part of the history that we know of, of Egypt. And these foreigners were called the Hyksos. And basically, it's an invasion of people that came from Asia, the, the subcontinent where you would find Canaan and uh, today the, the, the peninsula of Turkey and so on. Um, and basically, they don't know if these people came in with force and took over or if they just kind of migrated in. History is just unclear about how that happened. 
Here's a quote from one source. Egyptian rulers of the 13th dynasty were unable to stop these new migrants from traveling to Egypt from Asia because they were weak kings who were struggling to cope with various domestic problems, including possibly famine. That struck my attention when I read that because they don't really know how these foreign kings came to have domination over Egypt, according to history, but they note that famine may have been a cause. I think that's kind of interesting. That goes along with the biblical stories. Hyksos is actually a word that means foreign chiefs. It's an Egyptian word, but they don't know who these foreign chiefs were specifically in history. Um, but for t there were two dynasties uh, starting around 1674 B.C. Two the 15th and the 16th dynasties were all Hyksos rulers. So basically, Egyptians didn't sit on the throne in Egypt. There were foreigners that ruled the country during those two dynasties. Now, according to the Bible, the Hebrews were in Egypt for 430 years. And it's interesting that basically the time when the Pharaoh would have elevated Joseph to the position of being a leader in Egypt, it kind of fits with the time when these Hyksos came into the area. Don't know if maybe Joseph was the first of the Hyksos, or maybe there were other people that had come into the country, and it just kind of became customary to hand control of certain responsibilities over to foreigners um, who, who had wisdom or whatever. I mean, maybe when Joseph came in there, if he was elevated to a position, maybe, maybe he wasn't the first, maybe there were others who may have been elevated in such a way. But it's interesting that the time fits with the Hyksos period. So here's a map of Egypt and, and the area that it controlled during the time of the Hyksos. And what you see on the left there is the continent of Africa, and on the right, the continent of Asia. And the area that's in green is, uh, green to pink, is Egyptian controlled territories. Um, you'll see basically the Nile River almost in the center of the uh, picture, and then you'll see that the control that Egypt had kind of went up into the area of Canaan. Now, I kind of thought that was very significant because uh, in Genesis, um, basically, well, let's just read Genesis chapter 50. We'll start with verse 4. Joseph addressed the household of Pharaoh. He said, My father made me swear an oath. He said, I'm about to die. And in the tomb, that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now therefore let me go up, so that I may bury my father, and then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear to do. So Joseph's father, Jacob, basically before he came to Egypt, he had bought a place where he was going to be buried. It was the place um, where he intended to, to have his body placed after he died. And he had made his son Joseph promise to take him back and to put him into that grave after he died. And I always was curious when I would read this part of the scriptures because it's like, okay, uh, here is you know Joseph leading a band of Egyptians and they're, 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 they're this parade of Egyptians going up and placing Jacob into a tomb that was in a foreign country. That, that seemed a bit strange to me, but it was curious, if you remember the map before, the Egyptians actually had influence and control over the territory in Canaan during this time. So again, it fits very well. As we go on into the 1500s BC, we enter the period that's called the New Kingdom. And the New Kingdom is basically when the Egyptians started to rise up and retake control of their government. So basically there was a, a, the, the native Egyptian rulers basically said, we are in control now. They formed uh, a, a ruling uh, uh, power which was later called the 17th Dynasty. And basically they began to reject the control of these Hyksos kings. <coughs> um, here's a quote I'll read. Amos I completed the conquest of the expulsion of the Hyksos from the Delta region. And his reign marks the beginning of the 18th dynasty and the New Kingdom period. So in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, 
This is where we find this quote I read earlier. Now, a king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we are. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase in the event of war, join our enemies, and fight against us and escape the land. So it's odd that in the scripture it says that a king rose up who did not know Joseph. And at about the right time, the Egyptian rulers decided they were going to re reassert control over their country and kick these Hyksos out. Verse 11, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for favor. So they put these Hebrews to work. They were dominating over them to try and control their population and were forcing them to abandon their children, but they also put the adults to work, to labor, to build things. Interestingly enough, in the New Kingdom during this time, they began to build things according to history. Isn't that interesting? Here's a quote. Egypt was now at the zenith, zenith of its power, experiencing no military threat, Amenophis III, starting about 1403 B.C., pursued a life of pleasure and luxury. He engaged in an unprecedented building program aimed at self-glorification. In Egypt, an age of imperial magnificence ensued. I thought that was very interesting. Just when the Bible says they were beginning to become, become enslaved, it's amazing. In history, they start building things. And then Hotep III ruled from 14, starting in 1417 BC, and Egypt was at the height of its power. His extensive diplomatic contacts with other Near Eastern states, especially Mitanni and Babylonia, are revealed in the Armonic tablets. One of the great temple of the great temple he built at Thebes, only two statues, the so-called Colossi, remain. I mean, is it possible that the Hebrews were building these things? Maybe. Amenhotep III built extensively at the Temple of Karnak, that's in southern Egypt, including the Luxor Temple, which consisted of two pylons, a colonnade, and a new temple to the goddess Mat. Again, were the Hebrews building these things? It's possible. There were other, other 18th dynasty pharaohs, and I'll just go briefly mention them. These are, this is a, a short list, uh, but just a few to make mention. There was a, a, a female pharaoh, which was very rare, Queen uh, uh, Hatshepsut, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Thutmose III was called the Napoleon of Egypt because he expanded the Egyptian army. You know, at one time they were weak, but now they became a great military power. Interestingly, during this time, there was kind of a little bit of a cultural revolution because there was a pharaoh that, that, that came to power. His name was Akhenaten. And this pharaoh very, very curiously departed completely from the traditional Egyptian religion. They were polytheistic, meaning they, were, they, had, they had lots of different gods. But Akhenaten took a stand and basically said, we ought to worship only one god. And of course, he uh, identified what it should be. He, he thought that the sun traveled in our heavens should, should be the god that they worship. So it's just, it's very curious. He wasn't strictly monotheist, but it, it kind of seems like, you know, if you've got people who are living in and among you, the Hebrews who worship only one God, it seems that might have rubbed off a little bit. What other explanation could there be? Akhenaten had a son, and he's very famous, uh, commonly called King Tut. Um, he started out life with the name uh, Tutan, if I pronounce this right, I practiced this, but I didn't quite get it right. Uh, Tutankaten. Tutankaten. That means the living image of Aten. So Aten was the sun god, and so when the sun was born, he called him, ah, the living image of Aten. He was basically saying, you're bright as the sun. Well, this young king He's very famous because his tomb was not robbed. It was found completely intact. 
basically this son, when he came to power, he was a very young king, but basically he rejected the changes that his father made in his religious beliefs. And he even changed his name. Instead of being Tutankhamun, he changed his name to Tutankhamun, which means the living image of Amun, Amun being one of the traditional Egyptian gods in their polytheistic uh, society. And, and he is credited, his, uh, basically his main achievement according to history is the fact that he did restore the original religious beliefs of the Egyptians and rejected the changes that his father Akhenaten had made. So I thought that was very interesting that basically during the time when the Hebrews would have been in enslavement in Egypt, this is when King Tut was a ruler in that region. So finally we progress to the 19th dynasty. And the last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty basically handed control over to his military leader, which was Ramses I. That was in 1293 BC. Ramses' son Seti I succeeded him, ruled for uh, about 27 years. Uh, and then his son Ramses II succeeded him in 1278. And these are con generally considered the um, pharaohs who were around at the time when the exodus would have happened. So, common to the Setis the first and Ramses the second's reigns, basically, they continued those extensive building projects. Again, it would tie very closely in with the biblical story that the Hebrews were enslaved and were forced to build cities. <coughs> And the military campaigns that they launched were up in the, the area of Canaan were against a group of people called the Hittites and other various nomadic tribes. And again, it's kind of interesting because the Hittites show up in the Bible as well. But the conflicts in Canaan concluded with a peace treaty, the 21st year of the reign of Ramses II. That's 1257 B.C. Now let's turn to Scripture, Exodus chapter 3, start with verse 15. God also said to Moses, Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have given heed to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. And I declare that I will bring you up out of the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. It's just very interesting that the, the people that the Egyptians were fighting at that time were also mentioned in the records of Egyptian history during that time. Okay, so quick conclusions on the surveys that we've taken of Egyptian history. Egyptian history and, and the Bible account really are complementary to each other. Joseph's appointment as a ruler in Egypt kind of coincides with the Hyksos era during the Second Intermediate Period. In the 17th dynasty, there was a new king who did not know Joseph, who rose up to eject the Hyksos and resume control of their country. And then there was a period of new kingdom construction during the 18th and 19th dynasties. And that coincides with the domination and the eventual enslavement of the Hebrews. It, it just fits very, very well. Egypt's military campaigns in Canaan would have brought knowledge of that area of the world to the people of Egypt. So the Egyptian soldiers coming back from the battles in Canaan said, oh, wow, that's a great land up there, flowing with milk and honey. That's the kind of information that would have come back and would have been on the lips of the people of Egypt. So, so when Moses came and said, this is what God's told me to do, I'm going to bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey, that would not have been new information to them, most likely. Finally, Egypt's peace treaty with the Hittites kind of lines up nicely with the Bible's description of Canaan when the Hebrews do eventually arrive there. That will be in the next lesson that we have. Basically, the description in short was the Hittites were everywhere, but the Egyptians were nowhere. So we know that the Egyptians had influence up in the area of Canaan, but basically about the time when the Hebrews would 
have entered Canaan to, you know, after the Exodus, it, it really fits what they described, what they saw. They didn't see Egyptians all over the place. They saw Hittites. And again, that lines up very well the fact that there was a, uh, a, a treaty between Egypt and the Hittites. Finally, one more point. Because the Bible again says that there was a 430 year period of time when the Hebrews were in Egypt. And it's just very interesting that that is extremely consistent with Egyptian history. When the Hyksos were there, and basically the end of these building projects. 430 years from roughly a short distance, a short time into the Hyksos period, basically down to the rule of Ramses II. That's about 430 years. It's, it's really odd. But that, so the conclusion that I draw as just an honest person who's looking at the Bible and looking at Egyptian history side by side is they fit. They fit very well. So back to our lesson, unstoppable promises. All the things that we've talked about in terms of Egypt and Moses and so on, basically we're covering through Exodus 1 through 14. And again, our focuses today were to place the story in context with previous Bible lessons and with Egyptian history, and that's what we've done up to this point. But before we conclude, we want to understand what God's promise was and how He fulfilled it. God promised Abraham that his descendants would inhabit the land of Canaan. This was the promise that we basically learned about uh, two lessons ago. God had made many promises to Abraham, but one of them was, I'm going to give you this land, and, I'm going to, and the other promise was, I'm going to give you descendants that will be very numerous. And the land of Canaan was the land that was promised to Abraham for his descendants, and that's why we call it the promised land. God reaffirmed that promise to Moses. He was going to bring them to the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. But there was a problem. Because there was a great barrier that stood in the way. The people of the Hebrews, the children of Israel, were the slaves of the Egyptian Pharaoh. They were laboring from them to build these great construction projects. And Egypt at that time was, was literally the most powerful nation on earth. So they are enslaved, and they didn't have the, the free will and the liberty to just decide to go to Canaan. They, that was, they, would, they would have killed them before they allowed them to leave. But God had made this promise. God had made this promise. Hebrews chapter 11, 23. What do you do when you're up against the wall, when there's a great barrier in the way, when you don't understand how you're going to get from point A to point B? You believe that God is going to carry you through. That's faith. Believing in something that doesn't seem to be possible, but you know God has promised it to you, that's faith. Hebrews 11, 23. By faith, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months after his birth because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. I don't think beautiful in the sense of, oh, cute baby, but beautiful in the sense that God's hand was on him. They, they surely sensed that God was going to use him. So against all odds, against the command of the king, they hid him instead of abandoning him as they should. But when the time came that they were forced to abandon him, they put him in God's hand, and by faith, they were not afraid. Continuing with verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was, a, he was the grandson of the Pharaoh. He, he could have been in line of, for the throne himself. He was a prince over Egypt. But Scripture says that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin for a season. He considered abuse suffered for the Christ to be greater than wealth of the treasures of Egypt. He was looking ahead to a reward. He felt 
that calling that his people were suffering and that being in the palace, living a life of pleasure, it just it wasn't it wasn't right for him. And it took a great step of faith to say, I am a Hebrew, I'm not an Egyptian. It took a great step of faith to stand up for that belief that he had, that calling that he felt. Continuing with verse 27. By faith he left Egypt unafraid of the king's anger. For he preserved, he persevered as though he saw him who was invisible. He had been taught about Egyptian gods and about Egyptian religion and about Egyptian traditions. He was an Egyptian pharaoh. Or he was an Egyptian prince, I should say. So to leave his position and to leave Egypt, that took a great amount of faith. But he, he persevered, he continued on as though he could grasp this God that was the God of the Hebrews. Verse 28, By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Now this is later on after he was in the desert 40 years and came back to Egypt. The destroyer of the firstborn, this is a reference to the one of the, the last of the ten plagues that God used to break the will of the Egyptians. So briefly, we can uh, basically just mention that the Hebrews enslaved, and that there didn't seem to be any way for them to, to go into Canaan. It was necessary for God to step in and to do something miraculous. And that's exactly what happened in the story. Ten plagues were brought into the Egyptians. Water turned into blood. There were frogs. There were lice. There were flies. There was disease on livestock. There were boils, hail, thunder, and fire, locusts, and eerie darkness, unexplained darkness. And the last one was the firstborn of each house died. Now, whether you believe that these were miracles or whether you just believe that these happened on their own, as some people do, the point, and really the important point here, is that it came at just the time it was needed for these Hebrews to set free. And if you read the biblical account, before every one of these plagues, God spoke to Moses to tell Pharaoh that you, go, you let my people go. If you don't let my people go, this is what's going to happen. And he always predicted what would be the next plague that would affect Egypt. So if you predict something and it happens, well, maybe the first time you can pass it off. You predict it again, and then a plague happens, well, you can pass it off. But ten times this happened. Ten times the Pharaoh saw Moses predict a plague, and then the plague happened. And there's scripture basically where God says, I, I'm doing this to prove to the Egyptians that I am God. So you can't dismiss ten times. I think the Egyptians were convinced. Because after the tenth and final plague, the Pharaoh agreed to allow the Hebrew slaves to leave. He just couldn't discount it. This was too powerful. God, the God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was greater than any magic they had in Egypt, among all of their religious um, leaders, among all their magicians and so on, they had nothing that could combat this. So he agreed to let them go. So the Hebrews, by miracle, by God's unstoppable promise, were allowed to pick up and begin to leave. But that's not the end of the story, because after they were gone, Pharaoh was, oh my goodness, what have I done? All of our laborers who were building all these monuments and everything, they have departed. And so Pharaoh started to change his mind. He gathered his forces. He sent them after them. And the Hebrews came to the edge of the water of the Red Sea. And the armies pursued behind them. Now God had promised to bring them to the land flowing with milk and honey. That land that he had promised to Abraham. And that he had revived that promise to Moses and restated it. They were, they were supposed to go to Canaan, but they have a, a sea in front of them and an army behind them, and they were boxed in. What's the only thing you can do 
What's the only thing you can do when you can't get over the obstacle yourself? You trust in God's promises. And this is exactly what happened. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. Some people believe that the waters parted instantaneously the way that it's depicted in movies. Well, that's not really what happened. Moses held his rod up for an entire night and it said the wind blew on the water. Well, some people say, well, that, that could have happened just naturally. Well, you know, it's interesting. It happened just at the time that the Hebrews needed it to happen. That's the real miracle. Not that it happened, but that it happened. God made it to happen when they needed it to happen. I've heard a lot of arguments about, about whether or not the sea was actually parted. You know, well, they didn't go across on dry land. They went across in ankle-deep water. But, you know, regardless of how you believe about that, I believe that they went across on dry ground because that's what the Scripture says. But regardless of how you believe that, the Hebrews who were previously slaves, they didn't have weapons, they didn't have training, they didn't have all those things. They were being pursued by the most powerful army on the face of the planet. And they escaped to the far side of the Red Sea. But this great army could not pursue after them. The waters came back on them. Ever how you want to imagine that? But the Hebrews made it and the Egyptians drowned. And that's the real miracle here. When God makes a promise, there is no army on earth that can stop it. When God makes a promise, He will keep it. When God makes a promise, it is unstoppable. The Pharaoh couldn't stop it. The soldiers couldn't stop it. The magicians couldn't stop it. Because the people had faith. They're unstoppable promises. Unstoppable promises. Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting verse 8 reads, It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that He swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery and the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love Him, and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Know therefore, I'm going to read it one more time, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love Him. When God makes a promise, He will keep it. And He made the promise to these people because He loved them. God's love is very, very deep. It's a greater love than we can even imagine. John chapter John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love was not exclusive to the people who were the children of Israel, these Hebrews who were the slaves, who went to their promised land. God's love is not exclusive to them. He loved everyone on this world that He gave His Son. That's a promise to you and me. That's a promise to all of us. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9-10, through 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth confession is made and you're saved. Finally, I'll read Romans chapter 8, verse, starting with verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth can nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves us so much that He makes 
promises to us. He's promised us that even though we die, God is not going to leave us in the grave. That is the most powerful promise that there is because there's something that's common to each and every one of us is we're all going to die at some point. It's something that every man will face. But God's love extends even into the grave. And He is going to raise us up and He made a way to do that. And there's nothing that can separate us from us. And that promise is unstoppable. That promise is unstoppable. If you believe. If we believe and accept God's promise and apply it to our own self and our own life, that promise is unstoppable. God's love is a promise. Would you be in a relationship with Him today? Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you right now. Father, for those that are watching this through the internet, through video, Father, I pray for each and every one who hears this message. Father, you have made promises to each and every one of us. Father, I speak for myself when I say, I believe in the promises that you have made for me that apply to me. The promise that you're not going to leave me in the grave. And I believe that the means by which you have made that possible is through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I believe that you raised him from the dead. And I know that that is what is necessary to be a partaker of that promise. I believe that he rose from the dead for me. He was crucified for me. He went into the grave for me. And he rose again for me. And because he has risen from the grave, Lord, I also believe that he is at your side as the Bible describes. That you have elevated him to a position that he is Lord over all the earth. And I make him my Lord too. I submit to him and say publicly that Jesus is my Lord. Father, I thank you and praise you for everyone who prays that prayer. I thank you and praise you, Father, that the promises that you have made apply to that new creature in Christ, to that person who's accepted you. Father, I thank you for the relationship that we have and that we share, and I thank you that you've been made it available to everyone who hears this message. Father, I pray that as we leave this place here today, Father, that you'll help us to remember this lesson, that you'll help us to believe, and Lord, that you'll help us to always walk with you in that closer and closer relationship. Father, we praise you and thank you. Ask these words in Jesus.